It's already like three years uh, when I'm working for FreeBSD, so yeah. Uh, so uh, our today outline, I will present you Acasticum itself. I will describe what it is and uh, how it works a little bit. Then I will show you how we capsicumize some of the base tools. And then I will present you a new uh, debugging infrastructure, which was presented uh, last year, which is connected to the capsicum. And um, then I will uh, tell you a little bit how the Casper works and what it is itself. And I will tell you a little bit about the future, so outgoing work uh, in capsicum world. So, capsicum. So in the dark ages of uh, computer science, uh, our process had something called ambient authority, which means that they had access to every single thing in our computer. That means they can uh, create a connection to whatever they want. They can open any files from our disk. Of course, there are some restrictions about the users and so on, but mainly uh, process can do anything they want. So Capsicum, uh, use uh, is implementation of so-called capabilities, which is the different, uh, totally different thing from ambient authority. That means in capability mode, we say that process has access only to the thing that uh, the process should have access to. So if uh, process works on file system, then it don't need to connect to the network. So the uh, he has some access to file system, but he don't have any access to uh, to um, networking. So Capsicum was introduced in FreeBSD 9. Uh, it was implemented uh, mostly in uh, Cambridge and uh, um, by Robert Watson and Jonathan Anderson, with some cooperation from Google, uh, from Ben Lowry. Uh, so, the uh, kernel infrastructure of Capsicum <laughs> is one simple sys, uh, sysctl, which is capenter, which enters to the capability mode. After entering, after calling the syscall, uh, we don't have access to any global namespaces. So here are some, here are all the global namespaces that we have in um, <coughs> FreeBSD. So, for example. Uh, if we uh, enter the capability mode, we don't have access to uh, file path namespace. That means we cannot anymore open any uh, directories files on our disk. Or we don't have access to a protocol address, which means that we cannot create any connection to the uh, network. So uh, another part of Capsicum is so-called capability rights. Capability rights are um, Writes uh, the uh, I call it like um, local capabilities. It's stored in the descriptor, so we can open, for example, a descriptor to a file system, to directory, and that means that we have a capability to that directory. We can do anything we want in that directory. So going a little bit further, Capsicum implements so-called capability rights, which means we can even further. Uh, um, limit that descriptor itself. We can say, okay, this descriptor is read only or write only. That means that if somebody will, if we have a descriptor read only and somebody tries to write, then kernel will say, no, you don't have a capability to, that, uh, to do that. So here are some of cap uh, uh, Capsicum writes. Uh, we have like cap read or cap app append. It's sometimes the capability writes, uh, our Capsicum writes are um, dependent on the type of the descriptor. So for example, we have a cap accept, which will be used only on the socket. Um, so, uh, and cap receive, which also will be used only on socket. So we can get capabilities uh, in two ways in Capsicum. One is by, uh, by getting access to some directories or some uh, descriptors before entering the Capsicum. So before, in the, for example, in the main phase, we um, open some directories, we open some socket connections, and uh, we enter the capability mode. In that way, we have uh, only access to those um, those uh, capabilities which we uh, asked before entering the capability mode. Another way is uh, by delegation. So 
because we can send descriptors by using Unix domain socket, we can send descriptor from one process to another one. So if we have, uh, if some process have access uh, to some directory, for example, or some other resource, then he, we can ask that process to give us the permission to that resource. So we have, for example, a sandboxed process with Capsicum, which can speak with another process, which privilege one, which has access to some resource. And we can ask that privilege process to give us the um, access to resources that we want. So for example, um, we can ask the privilege process for some more files or some, uh, some more, uh, for, or some connection to the network. So is Capsicum hard? Capsicumizing hard. Uh, it's not for a new code. When we design everything in, compa uh, in a separate, uh, in, in with, some, uh, with some separation, the implementation of Capsicum in our program is really, really easy. Uh, at Wheel System, we use it for almost our, our process or for, our, uh, for all our demons, but we design this operate, uh, our uh, ecosystem to support that. So what about existing one? Is it hard or not? So we, in 2015, we had a Capsicum implemented in few tools. There are a few nice tools like TCP DAM or DH client, um, but most of them are SSHD, but we still was lacking from a lot of uh, base system tools. And unfortunately, uh, it took us a long time to get uh, when we are now. In 2016, we have a little bit more programs that we uh, capsicum mice. So there are simple programs like, um, like YES, which is also capsicumized, but we have also a little bit more complicated and which are not uh, even in base system like IRS, uh, IRS E client, IRS IRC client, IRC, or a package, which also is capsicumized uh, whenever it's, uh, it's need. Even if we receive some uh, if we receive some package from the internet and we want to um, check the checksum of this uh, package we download from the internet, it's uh, the, the um, comparing uh, uh, the uh, counting of the hashes is done in, capsicum, uh, in capability mode. So our story starts from two bugs in um, 2016 of BS patch. Those are was very easy. Uh, those was very simple bugs which uh, allow us to exploit BS patch. Uh, one of them was uh, one of them was uh, uh, integer overflow, and uh, another one was a uh, 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 sorry. Uh, there was a integer overflows. So. Uh, Alan Jude, seeing those two patches, decided that, hey, how hard would it be to, uh, to sandbox BS patch? So it turns out it wasn't so hard. So first of all, uh, first of all we need to read some code. I hope you see a little bit uh, very good this code because we will have a lot of uh, code in this presentation. Uh, so for step zero of every sandboxing is to read the code. We need to understand how the code works. It's not important if we are using seccom, pledge, or capsicum, or whatever. We need to understand what our code does. So, uh, BS patch is an uh, application that uh, uh, to, for patching the um, source code or some uh, files. Um, so it's work mostly on uh, two files, one which is patch and another file that we, uh, we are patching. So here we have some random opens, which I mentioned <laughs> earlier, that we need to open some files in a BS patch. And those are interesting things in Capsicum because we cannot uh, open files in capability mode. So Step one is to reorganize the code. Like I mentioned before, one of the uh, ways to obtain any privileges in the uh, capability mode is to open everything that we need before entering the capsicum itself. So we just reorganize the code and we put all the opens 
before entering the capability mode. So it's, we just need to call cap enter after all those opens and we are already sandboxed the BS patch. We can go even further and we can see that uh, most of the, uh, we can see how the uh, application is working with those description. Uh, here, for example, it's just do, uh, it's, uh, doing some reads. And here we have some F6. So after reading that, we can go a step further and, um, and limit the descriptors to do only that. So we have, for example, we, we have what uh, I showed you before. We give the uh, descriptors uh, capability to re read and seek. If somebody would ex still exploit the BS patch, then he, don't, uh, he can't do anything more with these descriptors and read and seek. So here is a patch for the, uh, for the sandboxing the uh, CMP program, which is a very easy <laughs> tool to, for uh, comparing two files. And uh, there, in Capsicum, we, ha we had uh, some duplicated code, which we was doing all the time the same, the same in every application. So we went, uh, for example, here, we are uh, limiting uh, the std out file description. Most, uh, most of the programs in uh, base system are using um, std out and std in descriptor. So this is what's done in many, many applications. Uh, this is a little bit um, more complicated code because it, we not uh, only uh, limit the uh, capability rights on the descriptor, but we also limit the IOCTLs that we can do, do on those descriptors. And another example, which uh, is that uh, in many applications, we need to use, for example, error functions, which prints not some nice error message. And unfortunately for the um, NL, uh, NLS, uh, native language support, we need to uh, pre-open some files in the system. So unfortunately, uh, this is uh, not allowed in uh, capability mode. We cannot open the, uh, any files in, after entering the cap mode, uh, capability mode. We need to pre-open them before. So uh, we introduced so-called Capsicum helpers. Those are a few inline functions that allow us to limit some of the uh, some of the most popular uh, things. So we have like cap h limit stream, which limits all the um, pop, uh, all the free dis uh, file description to, for std out, std in, and std r. Or we can call the separate functions like std out or std in to limit only one of them. So instead of doing all that work that I show you in the previous slide, we can call one function which will do uh, that for us. So unfortunately, like I mentioned, libc isn't uh, our friend and um, like R needs for, from some uh, NLS files for native language support, uh, we uh, have a little bit more uh, issue with libc. For example, local time need to read a um, time zone for uh, our operating system. It's done only on the first call of local time and it's cached the time zone for us, but when we call the first time the local time, it, uh, it's pre-opened those files. So if we would do local time the first time after entering the capability mode, then unfortunately we would get wrong time. So we need to somehow pre-open those files. So we do that by uh, introducing more uh, Capsicum helpers like uh, cut pages, which is done for um, caching the uh, NLS files, or the TZ data, which allows us to pre-cache the local time uh, data. So uh, we can now deduplicate code, and now the code looks a little bit uh, simple. Uh, we just uh, limit the std out and use the another Capsicum helper to cache the uh, NLS pages. Um, okay, so now I would like to sh tell you a little bit about the debugging infrastructure which we have in uh, Capsicum. So uh, from the beginning, uh, Keytrace implements supports from Capsicum. 
So we can trace our program and we are getting the information about the traits of the program. So Keytrace allows us to see which syscalls are called and what was the exit status. So uh, the support for uh, Capsicum in Keytrace uh, is basically that it tells us which capabilities are missing. Unfortunately, this um, this approach has uh, uh, two um, two problems. One of them is that it's very easy to miss something. We just don't see. We can miss something in Catrace, and we need to also to use Catrace on every sandbox program to know what was the trace of the program. So we need to see uh, which Cisco was known and if the Cisco. Uh, uh, ended with error. So it's very hard, it's very easy to miss something. And it's hard also to cover all patch, uh, patch, uh, patches in the program because there are some ifs which can be called or can be, um, can be true in some, uh, some condition and not true in another. So we need to uh, test it in many, many ways. So um, here's an example of catrace. Uh, output, we call the cap enter and we try to uh, open some uh, file that is not allowed in capability mode. So, uh, Constantine uh, presents a new uh, sysctl, which is called enotcap, which uh, uh, trap enotcap which uh, if something is uh, done and it's not allowed in capability mode, the process will, uh, the, the kernel will send the uh, trap signal to the process. So we will create uh, some core dump to, for analyzing our process. This is a little bit more, uh, more handy in working system. We can have like a lot of uh, cap uh, capsicumized uh, programs and we can um, just see if something is starting broken in our uh, system. Um, we can also um, enable that by ProCTL uh, in our code if we want only one process to, to be um, uh, to be um, traced, and but the, um, this approach has also the same issue like before. It's hard to cover all paths of the program, and we are not sure if uh, we are uh, we are not failing in some some conditions. So here is uh, the uh, core dump from one of the program that was uh, failing capability mode like we can see we have a nice um, trace of the program where it was failing in uh, in capability mode so we was calling the open which was is not allowed in our code in capability mode so now i will introduce you to the casper um casper is um uh, it's a uh, library that provides us the functionality that are not allowed in capability mode. So for example, if we want to um, create some sockets or open some files, which, are, which is not allowed to, uh, in uh, Capsicum, we can ask Casper to do that for us. So if we have uh, some, uh, some code that is duplicated in many programs, like we, for example, want to open uh, some files and we don't want to fork and implement everything to uh, uh, all the IPC between the processes that asking about give me, the, uh, give me another uh, descriptor to the file or give me another directory or give me another, uh, another connection to the internet, we can do that using Casper. So the APIs of Casper is very similar to libc. We, we try to not modify the APIs at all. So for example, if we have a get host by name function and we have uh, so equivalent in uh, Casper, it's, uh, it's exactly the same interface between a libc version of get host by name and the Casper one. So the idea behind Casper is to make a thing uh, very easy to, to separate the programs. And we need to create Casper because Casper is the fork of our pro program before entering the capability mode. So how Casper works? So we have some process 
And in that process, we call a function called cap init, which create as the Casper. And now Casper, we can ask Casper to do some stuff for us. But before that, Casper is also forking the second time, so-called Zygote. Zygote is a very lightweight process that will be uh, used to create a new services uh, in our, uh, for our uh, programs. So now when we call a CAP service open, for example, to open the DNS service, uh, we, will, uh, we will clone the Zygote and create a service from it. And after that, Casper will pass us the connection to the service. And uh, after that, uh, if we only want to open one service, um, we can close the connection to the Casper, or we can ask uh, Casper to create us more services, for example, a file system service or um, some other uh, service. So uh, after that, we can call close, um, we can close connection to the Casper, and we can talk uh, directly to the service, and we can ask him to provide us some information, like for example, the DNS resolution. Uh, resol resolving containers. So right now we have uh, five Casper services. And I can mention the system uh, DNS services, which allow us to resolve some DNS names. We have GRP uh, service, which allow us to work with the uh, group, uh, group operations, like searching uh, information about the groups. We have a PWD. Um, which is used for uh, password database operations. We have a random um, service, which allow us to obtain some uh, random, uh, random uh, data from a service. And we have also CCTL service, which allow us to uh, get uh, information from, uh, from the uh, operating system. So what is also very interesting about Casper is that all those services can be even further uh, limited. So we can say that, okay, we want to resolve only IPv4 DNS. If somebody will try to resolve IPv6, Casper would return an error that this is not allowed. Or we can even go a little bit further and say, okay, I want to, uh, I want to limit Casper to be able only to resolve one domain. Like, I don't know, Google Pal, uh, Google.com. And uh, if we will try to resolve others' names, then Casper would say, okay, that's, that's not allowed in our system. So this is the limitation in the Casper itself, but we can also go a little bit further and limit the uh, Casper itself and say, okay, I'm interested in creating only system DNS and not, uh, not others' uh, services. So here we have a trace route. We have a patch for the trace route, which uh, use uh, Casper for sandboxing. <laughs> so, like I mentioned before, we um, we uh, create uh, Casper by calling cap init. It's done on the um, on the top of the uh, patch. Then we open uh, service by calling cap service open, we uh, open the DNS service, and we are limiting the service to name and address to for the following, and we are limiting Casper for uh, IPv4 only. Uh, and after, uh, after we do that, we can enter the capability mode, and uh, this is, uh, we also limit here the, um, uh, so yeah, we also limit the other things in uh, in trace route itself, uh, like we limit the send socket to be able only to send this uh, the uh, packages, and we limit the receive socket only to be able to receive. After that, we need also to replace our uh, get host by name syscalls. A function called to cap get host by name. Unfortunately, right now we also add uh, the if devs that if, uh, for example, trace root isn't in uh, is um, uh, uh, it's not in the it's, it is in the base system, but it's not uh, it's maintaining also by others. So we need to add like uh, if devs that we have or not have Casper itself in the base system. Um, so now I would like to tell you about the, uh, a little bit about the future of Capsicum and what its ongoing work in, in that field. 
so uh, one of the things we are working right now is Casper Mox. Like I showed you before on the, the uh, patch, we uh, have uh, a lot of if devs in our code. So the idea uh, uh, of Casper Mox is that we will hide all the if devs inside the Casper itself. So Casper will this. Uh, you will only compile Casper once, and Casper will decide if we have uh, an uh, if we we are using a real function or not. So we have all uh, all Casper functions will be mocked uh, for us. So we will not need to uh, do that in the code itself. Um, the, uh, there, there, uh, there is existing a review of this change. Unfortunately, uh, it is like a third uh, implementation of, of those mocks. Uh, we had a few ideas how to do that. One of them was by uh, use, just mock it in the library. So we would have um, a libcasper uh, version of library which is not uh, use, uh, it's not doing anything, it's just calling the standard libc functions. And this uh, approach was dropped because we wa didn't want to link to the library that don't do anything. So um, the approach that we are uh, trying to um, to do now is to implement uh, mocks using a lot of inlines and defines. And we would not need to uh, link to the library itself. We would just need to uh, we would just need to um, include the header itself. Uh, so another I, we have a lot of uh, ideas uh, around the Casper. So one of them is to uh, integrate the Casper in the libc itself, and we would just uh, in, inside the libc, we would uh, decide if we have Casper or not, or how we want to do like get host by name function. If we want to use in the secure way using other process, or we want to use the standard path. Uh, other approach which we are thinking is uh, make our libc in FreeBSD more pro plug pluggable. That means that we would uh, we could register ver a different version of uh, libc. A different version of get host by name depending on um, on libraries that we are linking to. So, for we would have like structure or um, of the functions, and we would just uh, in our um, we we could just uh, change the implementation of um, of the get host by name dynamically. So right now we also need to call cap init with those changes. We also could do that in the start uh, start functions. That means that we would not need to call it in the main function itself. We would just have the Casper and we would just use it um, transparently with the, uh, with uh, in our program. So we are so thinking about the sandboxing services itself. Right now, Casper uh, is uh, not sandboxed at all. It's uh, um, have, it's, uh, it is a privileged uh, process and he has um, ambient authority to everything. So we, uh, if somebody would, um, would exploit the IPC between Casper and the process, then he would uh, get access to all of our data. So we also want to uh, somehow uh, sandbox the Casper uh, itself and uh, we think this uh, Everything which are we doing here with the Casper is also about the reducing the TCP trust the code base. So we don't need to uh, now uh, trust the whole uh, libc code, but we need to trust that uh, our uh, IPC library is safe between Casper and, and process. So. Um, it also some uh, it is also some surface for the attack, but it's still smaller than whole libc. So we are also thinking about introducing new uh, Casper services uh, like file system, which is missing from uh, for a while, uh, and it's um, important for us because it's stopping us from. Uh, Mm, sandboxing a lot of base tools like um, uh, tools that are uh, use, uh, that are working on multiple files, like for example, grep. 
Um, we are also thinking about uh, implementing, for example, uh, services called system, uh, system TLS, which we would be um, would would allow us to create a TLS socket, and a Casper would um, provide us all the negotiation between our process and the uh, internet. Uh, we also um, uh, want to implement the uh, socket. Uh, services which will allow us to create uh, arbitrary socket to the internet, uh, raw sockets, uh, without any encryption and so on. Uh, we, um, we was discussing also to implement like uh, configuration uh, service which will provide us the configuration of, of the file. So we would have like uh, this is also very interesting from the uh, operating uh, system point of view because uh, we can have uh, some uh, a lot of different uh, formats of the configuration and Casper would be uh, responsible for parsing them and, uh, and send us the configuration in a unified way. So uh, there are two more very interesting uh, services, syslog and login, and we will look a little bit closer why we would like to implement them in uh, FreeBSD. So, uh, unfortunately, right now, if we would uh, enter, uh, if we, will, we are using the um, e, uh, the system that um, send the trap in a cap, uh, trap in a cap. Uh, in our system, the each client on the start of the system will tell us that uh, something is wrong. So let's see a little bit closer what is wrong with the uh, with the DH client. As we can see, it's create a, a core dump for us. Uh, it's like I said, it's receiving the trap uh, signal from from the kernel. So, if we will see uh, closer in the trace, we see that EFC is trying to do connections, uh, connect to the uh, somewhere. So, if we would see a little bit closer to the um, uh, to the code, we can see that it's called from the uh, so DH client is trying to do connection, and uh, as we can see, uh, I didn't mark that, but I hope it's. Uh, uh, visible for you, it's uh, trying to call, uh, it's the connection which is trying to do is done by syslog itself. So we can see now the code of the DH client, the sandboxing uh, of the DH client, and it tries to pre-open the syslog before entering the capability mode. So everything should be fine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and uh, uh, syslog is very interesting and I think it's kind of messy code, unfortunately. And uh, open log don't return us any value. It means it's always succeeding. So we, we cannot fail when we try to open log. We also can fail when we are trying to log something. So it's always succeeding. Unfortunately, this isn't uh, true uh, because uh, as we can see, DH client is started after syslog D. So uh, it turns out that DH client don't, uh, cannot connect to the syslog at the time. And we cannot even uh, print the error because we don't know about that. Uh, so we have two approach to this problem. We can change the order of the syslog and the uh, DH client and uh, or we can just implement the Casper services which will provide us the, uh, uh, all the uh, functionality of syslog D. Um, I didn't mention that um, why the, um, this connection was tried to do and why it's failed. It's because the syslog tried to reconnect every time when we try to log something to the, uh, in the operating system. So if we're trying to send some log and it's not connected to syslog D, then he tries to uh, reconnect. And because we don't have information that it's connected or not, it's failed in the capability mode because he's trying to do a connection to syslog D and this is disallowed in capability mode. So another example is SSHD, which is also failing on my machine when I enter the uh, enot cap mode. 
so when I try to SSH to it, I see in the DMask that uh, something is wrong with my SSHD. So after doing all the work with the, seeing the debugger and seeing what is wrong with the trace, we see that there is a part of the code which is called GTP PVU class. This code is failing in our, uh, in our sandbox. This uh, function is responsible for, uh, for reading the login.conf uh, uh, login.conf and etc login.conf files. And uh, unfortunately, we can't pre open those files because before auto authorization, we don't know which file to open because it's a home directory of the user that is trying to uh, log in. So we also would be, uh, I, I'm also working on implementing the system log login to uh, provide the functionality for um, reading those files. And what is also int very interesting about this part of the code, which is broken at, uh, in the FreeBSD, is that this code exists only in the FreeBSD. This patch is maintained only, uh, maintained only by, uh, by FreeBSD developers. So I would like to thank a few people that uh, contribute a lot to the project uh, from, last, uh, from last year. Alan Jude, which done most of the uh, Capsicumize, uh, especially the BS patch. Uh, Baptiste, Conrad, and Ed, which also did a lot of uh, work around uh, Capsicum. And Constantine, which uh, implemented the um, SysTTL enot cap. So, thank you very much. Are there any questions? So, at this point, how many of the base programs, what percentage so, uh, at the um, beginning of the presentation, I saw, uh, so, <coughs> yes, so this is, uh, this is the all that are, was, uh, um, was sandboxed in the 2016, and the list before is uh, with the, all the uh, sandbox applications. So uh, those two lists com uh, contains all the sandbox applications right now in the uh, FreeBSD operating system. For the system that login service, have you actually booked the, the, the login.com parser in this? Yes, it is terrible. I've managed to make it better, but it's not much. <laughs> yeah, the interesting coordinating that would be happy work so that we could just throw the whole thing through a process. Yeah. Uh, this was my first attempt to read the uh, syslog. Um, code and it was very, very messy. And I'm very surprised that we use that code still. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's very messy. Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, so you're saying that you are trying to implement more services yes. for Casper. And uh, you said that you know Casper actually introduced some um, smaller uh, services like that. Yes. Does introducing new services actually increases the service attack or it doesn't? So uh, the service will be the same because it's still the same library that we are using for IPC. So the service, uh, the services will be the same, but we need new uh, services to make uh, Capsicum a little bit more usable in many cases. For example, we cannot implement uh, Grab uh, we cannot capsicumize grep right now because we are missing the whole uh, file system namespace. So we could do 
uh, like a workaround, like the fork from the grab and try to, you know, implement ad hoc the uh, service itself, but it would make the code, uh, I think, it, this would introduce uh, the bigger surface of attack because it's a specific implementation only for one application. More questions? Yeah. yeah, my question, just for my interest, uh, I think that now Casper and Casper are a little bit different rather than OpenBS in French. Yes. Uh, so please give me your idea about the difference between Casper and French. Okay, so. The difference is in the uh, approach of the um, of the rights that we are uh, accessing. So, Capsicum says that you have a right to some uh, capabilities um, inside the program, and they are managed by file descriptors. So, you have like the right to op to open the files in that directory, or you have a file, or you have a um, um, descriptors to connect to the internet and so on. Uh, in my opinion, in Pledge, the approach is a little bit different and you say, okay, this is the namespace, use that namespace. And you get the access to whole namespace. So in some cases, uh, Pledge is very useful. For example, if we would see the, uh, the version of Pledge at WC, it's great. It's just like one Pledge call entered, you have access to file system, I don't care anymore, right? And it's great. But if we would go a little bit further, and for example, if some developer would uh, miss, uh, miss uh, give uh, too many rights to the, uh, to the program, for example, I'm giving you the uh, access to my file system uh, namespace, and I also giving you the access to network, then the application itself isn't so secure because I can read all your data and send it over the internet. So, Pledge is more like about the um, uh, about the um, reducing the surface of the uh, attack in the application, uh, but making some um, some. Uh, Sorry, I uh, missed the word. Uh, making some. Mm, uh, sorry. Um, so it, it's easier to use, but it's a little bit less secure in some cases. I also what I'm also don't like about pledge, and I hope uh, OpenBSD people will f figure out how to fix that. Is that if you would fork. From in the pledge application and do exec on uh, any uh, on any program, then the new program is uh, without sandbox. So you can some in some cases uh, theoretically you can escape from the uh, sandbox itself. In Capsicum, you don't have uh, such uh, issue. You always are fully secure because you have only limited rights to do things in in Capsicum and. Uh, this is also why the capsicum is a little bit harder to implement it in, implement in some applications. Okay, um, I have a next question. Uh, all this approach, uh, I think that is uh, over 500 kernels they provide the French system for that. We previously have very few kernels provide the capsicum. So yes, we would like to do that. Uh, one of the things is the missing file system, uh, for example, that is uh, lacking from long time already. It sh should be done soon, I hope. And uh, we, uh, outside that, uh, so this stops us for uh, sandboxing all the programs that use the file system. So like grab, like WC, uh, and so on. This makes it a nightmare to sandbox such applications. 
And uh, besides that, yes, we would like to see more patches in, in Cap, uh, Capsicum and uh, more sandboxed application and yeah. To get back to the difference between Sledge and Capsicum, uh, for example, if you try to do Sledge via Cache, and in the Capsicum version, you can only read from the cache file and not write to it, and only write from the file you're caching and not read from it. Whereas with Sledge, you give the, the pledges a read and write, and means you can read and write to any file anywhere in the system. Right? So yes. If, if you apply Sledge, so again, it's a bigger uh, surface of attack, right? Because in Pledge, like you mentioned, you have access to a whole file system. It's read-write. You can do whatever you want with the file system itself. But uh, in Capsicum, you have two descriptors. You have only those two writes to work with, and there are very spe uh, specific ones, and you cannot do anything more. I will also add something uh, to the pledge versus text discussion. Um, one of the things where pledge versus text is that um, text is sort of into, it's sort of a form of object-oriented programming in a certain way. You get all the scripts to which you write, which means that it also works really well in applications that are built in an object-oriented way. Whereas with pledge, it's just the case that the program starts up and inside of the main function already have to decide which rights you're going to grant to the entire application. Pledges of which may work well for well, the BSD based system where tools are relatively compact. But in my opinion, I won't see scale in situations where you have to work with a lot of third party libraries, where it's really hard to judge from the outside how you're going to restrict the application. So for example, if you're going to make use of some kind of pretty complex um, I don't know, open Open, what's the name again? Open AL, Open AI, some kind of Open CD, that's the name. Open CD, yeah. Um, how are you going to judge from the outside which rights you need to put on the application to make the binary work correctly? That's something that's just pretty hard with caps, but with text, but it's pretty easy with caps. If everything is based on caps, then it's all about that. Yes, unfortunately, there is also. Uh, to be fair with the pledge, right? It's also hard uh, with a lot of uh, third-party libraries because they, for example, don't work with descriptors and do like some open hidden uh, calls to the uh, in the inside themselves. Uh, I remember we had like one issue uh, with uh, sandboxing. Uh, I don't remember which application, but it was the issue that we are. Uh, the, the library itself, third-party library, was opening directly the def random, and nobody saw that in the code. So we was unable to open the uh, random number generator, and we was using like uh, we didn't have enough uh, entropy to generate right uh, correct numbers. So to be fair, both approach has uh, downsides and uh, upsides, and. Uh, there are different approach to the problem. In my opinion, one is like Ed said, it's like objective uh, approach when you have access to the one object or few objects to the set of objects. And another one is to have uh, access to whole namespace. In some cases, the access to whole na namespaces works right, but in more complicated applications, it will have the exactly the same if we would like to do it in correct way, the, uh, the secure way, it will have the same issue. For example, I saw the implementation of the uh, Moot, the, the, the uh, mail client uh, um, uh, in Pledge, and they uh, in Pledge you uh, have access, of course, to the file system. You have access to the uh, to the uh, to um, to the network, and you have also access to the fork and exit. And this is done because they can't reload the configuration itself. So they just fork and 
uh, exec one more time the, uh, the application itself to regenerate, the, to reload the configuration. This is a big attack surface for the attacker because if I can uh, open the uh, client itself, why I will open the client itself? Maybe I will open Netcat with some arguments and just create a, a backdoor to, to the system. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's different approach, and in some approaches the pledge was great. Uh, in some, I would be more secure. Feel uh, I would feel more secure using Capsicum. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, you've been my interest, so uh, I want to go and try and customize something. Uh, can you tell me how uh, I should choose a nice, juicy target? What, what sort of things are in dire need of being tested? Uh, I didn't put it on the presentation, but we have a very nice uh, wiki page of the FreeBSD about the Capsicum. There is a full list of the uh, applications that are already sandboxed, and there is a list of the applications that are waiting and there are, uh, that we want to sandbox in the future. Uh, yeah, uh, more features about the program would make it uh, potentially risky and therefore uh, should be prioritized. So uh, the most risky, I will not give you the list of the application itself because uh, I, I don't remember, but the most risky applications are those that, uh, that are working with some kind of parsers, right? For example, Grab is a great example when we had a lot of uh, uh, issue with grabs because uh, it has a very complicated uh, syntax of regex and it's very easy to find somehow that uh, it's uh, it, uh, exploitable. So everything that is uh, like parsers and so on should be uh, should be um, sandboxed. For example, TCP dump, right? We are receiving the um, the package from untrusted source. We are also doing some analysis of this package. It's also very insecure. So we also are think. Uh, I would also recommend to find an application that is working with untrusted input, like for example the network one, right? I guess the applications like WC, for example, which only counts and don't work with real data itself, right? It's uh, can go on the uh, in the next step, basically. Another question. So, um, thank, you thank you very much. much.